I don't know how they got up and kept running, probably just adrenaline, but it's, it's crazy. Run down in broad daylight. New at six, the wild video showing a driver gun it and ram a group of pedestrians on the run. Plus garbage overflowing at some national parks because of the government shutdown, forcing state rangers to pick up the slack. And Sky 8 to the rescue. How our own chopper helped save a climber stranded on Mount Hood. We are going to begin, though, with that intense video out of northeast Portland. A driver jumping over the curb, chasing down a group of people running for their lives. Before we show it to you, though, we do want to give you a warning that the video might be tough for some people to watch. You'll see somebody get hit by a car, but it appears they are okay. Here's the video now. This is on Northeast Beach Court near 152nd. You see the vehicle there speed up and hit at least one of oh. these people running away. It is really hard to watch, sending them flying. Yeah, let's go to KGW's Mike Benner. He's been following this story for us live in the neighborhood where it all happened. Mike, that video, I, I, as many times as I've seen it, it's still shocking. Oh, it really is, Dan. Uh, you know, the damage from this violent collision was the first clue that something was wrong. Javier uh, Gonzalez came home to find his uh, rose bushes damaged. Uh, the utility box outside his house right here was mangled, and there were tire tracks through the nearby park. Now, Gonzalez called up his security video, and he was downright horrified by what he saw. A pickup truck driving up onto the sidewalk and running down three people, possibly teenagers, who were clearly trying to run away. Now, it looks as if the truck hits two of the three people. Somehow, some way, they're able to run away after all of this. The truck spins out in Wilkes Park before taking off as well. This happened last Thursday, late in the afternoon. Gonzalez called police. The video and information has has since been distributed at roll call. The hope is that officers can identify the truck and or the driver. Gonzalez is hoping they can. He says that person could have killed somebody. Take a listen. I think it was almost in the in the 30s and no one was out here, uh, which is good. Just, you know, I think of the kids that, you know, I have my little sisters and stuff, they'll come out and play out here in this park and even in front of my house on their bikes, you know, and it's just like any other day, any, you know, any other time of the year, that could have been a really horrifying accident. All right, as we mentioned, uh, Gonzalez called police. So too did somebody who was in the park and saw the uh, truck doing donuts. But so far, the three people on the sidewalk as well as the truck driver have not called police. You're asked to give them a call if you have any information about what happened. Back to you. Unbelievable that those answers still aren't had right now after the video we just watched, Mike. Thank you. A climber today stranded on Mount Hood after a whiteout. He called for help after that storm rolled in. Searchers eventually did reach him after our crew in Sky 8 spotted him waving for help. Devin Haskins is at Timberline Lodge now where the rescuers are heading right there with the climber in tow. Devin, what's the latest? Well, Dan, right behind me, you can see some of the uh, rescuers have come down off the mountain. We're still waiting for the climber to uh, come down as well. Uh, let's give you a little recap of what happened. It was right around 5 when the rescuers reached him. He was about a mile and a half from the top of Palmer Glacier. He called for help right around 1 after getting lost during those whiteout conditions. Like you said, Sky 8 was able to find him on the mountain and also assisted in the exact location. He's an experienced hiker, had some food and water, but no shelter. He's not hurt, just needed help after getting lost. Two different rescue groups assisted in this, leaving Timberline Lodge around four. They took a snowcat to the top of Palmer Glacier and then hiked to get him. Now that they've found him, that search part was over. They're about halfway down the hill. They should be here shortly, but uh, that was one of the harder parts. The whole thing is difficult, right? I mean, it's it, we're, we were able to locate him, which is sometimes the most difficult part of a search and rescue. Um, but getting him down, I mean, right now we're fighting, you know, of course the elements, we're fighting light. So I, I wouldn't say the most difficult part is over, um, but we're definitely on the downhill side of this thing. Now, Brian Jensen, the PIO with Clackamas County Sheriff's Office, who you just heard from, went in the snow cat to the top, said it's cold up there. The wind just bites right through you and conditions were changing constantly. Like I said, the group is in the process of walking down. They say they're about halfway down. The hiker and the, the rest of the group is going to catch a snowcat. They're about a half hour, 45 minutes from being right back down here at Timberline Lodge.
Back to you. Oh, we are so grateful for those rescuers Certainly. always. Thank you, Devin. A week long search for a missing woman is over tonight. Benton County officials say the body of 65 year old Suzanne Durheim was found in the Willamette River. Yeah, you might remember when search crews first found her truck in the river. This was east of Corvallis last week. There was no body inside when they removed it from the water. Durheim's family reported her missing when she didn't show up for work last Monday. The government shutdown is in its 25th day, but in many ways we're in the same place we were when it first began. Yeah, really, the demands for the wall haven't changed. Neither has the Democrats' willingness to fund it. We can't tell you President Trump rejected a short-term legislative fix and declared that he would, quote, never, ever back down. Congress is set to go on uh, recess next week, but House leaders say that's not going to happen if a deal is not reached. Portland's TSA workers are among the federal employees wondering when their next paycheck will be. And at some airports, the so-called blue flu has led to big delays. KGW's Pat Doris is live at PDX, where he mapped passengers arriving from all across the country, Pat. Right, Laura. Well, everybody I talked to had thought about this TSA issue, the slowdown, how it might affect their trip. A lot told me they were pleasantly surprised, but that might have just been the luck of when they flew. It's definitely got a lot of folks concerned. Travelers in Atlanta yesterday had to endure security lines that stretched nearly an hour and a half. Before that, sometimes have been even worse. Yeah, we've had waits as, as long as two and a half hours in the Atlanta area, but I think because of the time in which I flew, I did not suffer as much. But it was I clear. met the Reverend Mark L. Hutchins today as he arrived from Atlanta. His wait early this morning was not bad, he said. But it was clear to me, um, reading the faces, talking to, listening to, uh, the men and women that were um, were the TSA agents in the Atlanta airport that this shutdown has taken a toll on them and uh, my hope and prayer is that it ends soon and very soon uh, for our safety as well as their sanity. TSA security lines are stalled at some airports because workers are calling in sick to protest being forced to work without getting paychecks on time. The TSA reported yesterday nearly 7% of its workforce called in. On that same day a year ago, it was just two and a half percent. Still, the agency points out for the nearly two million who flew yesterday, 99 percent waited less than 30 minutes to get through security and 94 percent waited less than 15 minutes. Portland's longest wait time yesterday was 17 minutes. The worst places, Atlanta, Dallas Love Field and Honolulu. Ariane Islami estimated it took him an hour in Virginia. Yes, I mean, I was worried about it because uh, my mother had called me and she said, oh, you got to get there early, you know, that something's going on with the TSA and uh, some people aren't showing up to work or something like that. And uh, so I kind of got worried. Others like Rebecca Brown had no trouble. She's from Georgia. But Savannah, it was real quick, smaller place, but um, they're very cheerful. So that's that's a big plus. And I told him thank you like we're supposed to do. Amy Geddick arrived from Minnesota. I came from Twin Cities, Minneapolis. How was it? TSA was a breeze today. It was better than it's been in months, so I'm not sure what's going on, but I've had opposite effect of what I expected. It was a delight today. The TSA folks here told me they couldn't talk to me on camera today, but they are having a news conference on Thursday. In the meantime, here in Portland, they are showing up for work. Back to you. PDX spared for now as this shutdown continues. Pat, thank yep. you. The FDA will get back to work inspecting our food, but they will not be getting paid to do it. The FDA commissioner announced yesterday the agency will resume inspections of food facilities starting today. Inspectors will focus on high risk foods. They include cheese and other dairy products, as well as some fresh produce. The FDA has about 5,000 or so inspectors. They make 160 inspections per month. The commissioner did not know how many of those workers will be returning, though, said it'll be closer to just a fraction, about 700. In some cases around the nation, the shutdown has resulted in trash spilling over in our national parks. But here in Oregon, state park rangers are stepping up to help clean up federal lands. KGW's Keely Chalmers tagged along with two of those rangers today. She joins us live tonight at the Sandy River Delta Deus area near Troutdale. And Keely, you say the trash cans there are empty tonight. Yeah, that's right. And that is thanks to uh, those two state park rangers. This is one of several popular visitor spots here in the gorge that is managed by the U.S. Forest Service. The problem, the federal workers that usually take care of it have been furloughed. So the state 
is helping out. Thank you. It's work that is not going unnoticed. I think it's awesome. A couple times a week for the last two weeks, rangers with the Oregon State Parks Department armed with clean trash bags hit federally managed areas in the gorge to empty trash cans and pick up litter left behind. Today, we tagged along with them. We're just taking care of what we can and helping out where we can. Our first stop, the Sandy River Delta Day Use area near Troutdale. From there, we went to the Joaquina Falls Trailhead and then on to Horsetail Falls, all areas managed by the U.S. Forest Service. So whatever we can do to to help the, the feds, that's, that's what we want to do. The good news for us, we did not have to go into any restrooms. They were all locked. Not so good news for visitors. The gate was closed and the door was closed, so now we just have to find somewhere to go. The park rangers are working these cleanups into their daily schedule of state park duties, which is why they're asking Gorge visitors to stick to state or county managed parks in the area. People don't just distinguish between you know state park or federal park. It's just, just going to the park. But uh, we're just asking people to kind of look into it and kind of figure out where they're going in advance and make sure that they're open, they're staffed, and they're being taken care of when they get there. They point out without federal workers at the sites, the risk for car break-ins goes up. We saw evidence of break-ins at every one of the sites we visited today. The garbage, the restrooms get talked about a lot, but another aspect of it is their visitor safety. The state park rangers say they formed a tight bond with their federal counterparts during the Eagle Creek fire, so helping them out is a no-brainer. They just hope they won't have to do so much longer. We're all a team out here, so we help cover each other. So that's the nice part about it. Now, it's also important to point out, even though the federal maintenance workers have been furloughed, the federal law enforcement officials have not been. So they are still out here uh, ticketing folks who are trespassing on uh, uh, federal trails, U.S. Forest Service trails that have been closed, especially after the Eagle Creek fire. So just a heads up on that one. Back to you. All right, Keely, sounds good, thank you. Now to Oregon's homeless crisis spilling into our rivers. People living in broken down boats, trash piling up on the banks and in the water. KGW's Nina Melhoff digging a little deeper into the story for us today. And Nina, you found out why those abandoned boats are even there in the first place. That's right, Dan. Yeah, it's a lot different than when you want to get rid of an old car. Cars can mostly be recycled or the metal sold for scrap, but boats are fiberglass and that's just garbage. So private parties and mortgages, they're not paying that. They're just dumping those boats on the streets for the homeless. So pretty much everything in the back is going. Going to the scrap yard. The D painted on these old boats at Maritime Mobile Services in Vancouver stands for destroy. There is no classics unless they're wood boats. There's no money in them, there's nothing. That's the problem you're having. That's why you're seeing all these older boats laying around everywhere. Owner Mark Robertson does boat repairs and buys them for their engine parts and the metal that can be resold. This one had an inboard engine in it, the floors, everything, windshields, everything came out. The fiberglass hull is total garbage and Robertson has to pay between $250 and $3,500 to take it to the dump and be shredded. Most people don't want to pay to throw something away, so they don't. Oh, I've seen them on the street. Yeah, I've seen a lot of motorhomes on the street, a lot of boats on the street, just being left, you know. A couple of streets up in Seattle, they call it Boat Row. It's where the homeless come in, picking them up, patching holes, and trying to live aboard them illegally on our rivers. Monday, we showed you these awful photos of them half sunk in the Columbia, tied off to one another, another pile jumbled up on the shore, not to mention all the garbage. They leak toxic chemicals, battery acid, oil, and the sheriff's office believes at least five have sunk to the bottom next to Hayden Island. To make matters worse, the scrap yards just upped prices and started requiring titles for each boat they destroy. But Robertson estimates only half of old boats still have a title, so they're turned away from the dump, only to end up on the street or in the river. There's just no way of getting around it, so they just don't deal with it. They'll, like I said, you can scratch the numbers off the back of the boat, leave it anywhere. Nobody can, nobody will know whose boat it is. Ever. 
So who cleans this all up? Yeah, no and well, no one ever. So who cleans this all up? The Oregon State Marine Board takes bids from private contractors. They start at $8,000 and go way up from there. Up near Troutdale, there's a 40-foot transient boat that sunk about a year ago. That bid is $60,000 to take that sunken boat up. Nothing has happened with it so far. Back to you.